Lá na mata da Jurema, eu vi uma capivara. Ela estava bem comendo a semente da Jussara. A semente da Jussara, a semente da Jussara. Perguntei para a capivara que semente é. And I asked the capivara, what seed is that? The capivara answered, it's a certain jussarai. It's a certain jussarai. It's a certain jussarai. Enjoy the original. Way back when, we would come to the forest to take Jussara and we would do some deforestation, but then uh, other people would come in and find Jussara to sell, just to sell. So not only Jussara, we had uh, the fauna and the flora that was dying, and we had the interest of uh, doing reforestation in the community where we didn't have Jussara. So we said, the Ejusara palm tree will take 10 years to reach its adulthood, so to speak, and 15 to uh, produce uh, seeds. And the pupunha is like a bamboo, it, it, it grows very fast. So we want to plant both the shara and the pupunha palm. Uh, and we found out that the we are able to do different recipes. We can do cookies, we can do jams, we can do jusara. There's so many things you can cook with that. So we play around with this wonderful palm. Now I'm going to prepare my drink. It's called Mata Atlântica, Tropical Forest. This is the Jussara, a pulp. It is this uh, seed. I put it on a uh, blender, 200 grams of uh, the uh, pulp, and then a banana, then sugar, then one dose of a traditional cachaça, a white cachaça, also one uh, lime, and then you just blend it. And this is our drink, tropical forest. And this is what we have done. We wanted to revisit and to revisit this, this palm tree that was disappearing as a planters, producers. It's such a pleasure to be here because we see this process of improving our field, improving our production. And uh, so we want to restate this. We have to have this uh, wonderful uh, product. Ministério do Turismo. The Ministry of Tourism and Associação Casa Azul introduce the 19th International Literary Festival of Paraty. The project has the benefit of the uh, cultural law and vale mais cultura. It has the official sponsorship of Itaú and Instituto Cultural Vale. Production, Casa Azul, Special Secretary of Culture, Ministry of Tourism, Brazil, Federal Government. Essa mesa é ao vivo e é transmitida. This round table is live.
and we have three channels on the internet. Original audio, Portuguese or English. Choose the language of your preference. Questions might be addressed to the authors throughout the transmission uh, through our YouTube chat box. At the end of the meeting, some of the questions will be asked live to our guests. Have a great flip. Good evening, everyone, all those who are here with us today. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today with Alejandro Zambra and Ana Martins Marques, two authors I love. I would like to thank the team, uh, the curators, for having invited me to mediate this table. I am Hita Palmeira. I am editor uh, and critic, and I will uh, mediate, uh, which is uh, listening to the green. I guess mediate is not exactly the word of my choice because I am here to uh, listen to you. I will do a very brief presentation of both authors, and then I will try to guide this conversation to uh, Zambra's bonsais and uh, Anna's uh, gardens, uh, Zambra's prose, and Anna's uh, poem. Alejandro is from Santiago in Chile, and Anna is from Belo Horizonte in Brazil. They belong to the same generation. They were born during the military dictatorship in their countries. In the beginning of their, country, of their career, Zambra wrote uh, poetry a book from 1998, and Mudança from 93. Anna, until what I know, has not published prose, but she wrote about fiction. Both actually have their career perspassed or by uh, universities, they have all PhDs. They are what we would call uh, success, both public and critic. And if we have time, we'll talk about this. They were awarded for translation adaptations to uh, the movies, and they were subject to many academic works. And they're seen as two of the most original voices of their generation. Both of them have, were already in Pada Chifa Flip with one year difference. Zambra came in 2012 and Ana in 2013. Alejandro Zambra uh, has just had his work published by Compañía das Letras, in a volume called Ficção, Fiction, 2013-16. It has bonsai, uh, ways of going back home, my documents, and multiple choice, as well as other texts. On another volume, which almost uh, is the same size, his last novel, uh, Poeta Chileno, a Chilean poet. So in 2021, with the very few good news, we have available almost 1,000 pages of the wonderful, creative, fun, and moving writing by Alejandro. Ana Martins Marquez also has uh, this uh, list of good news for 2021. Her last uh, beautiful book, which is called Risca Esta Palabra, Cross This Word. You know, no word should be crossed from that book, was launched today by Compañía, this year by Compañía das Letras, and they republished last year her first book which is A Vida Submarina, Underwater Life, which in 2009 was uh, published by Scriptum. Anna is also the author of The Arte as Armadilhas on the Yard of Pitfalls, 2011, uh, the Book of Similarities, 2015, by Compañía das Letras, and uh, the uh, Book of Gardens in Kelonio in 2019. And uh, she also wrote Two Windows, uh, and with Eduardo Jorge, she wrote as if it were your house, this house is selected and it's by Redicario in 2017. So good evening, uh, both of you. Uh, my first big question, and please feel free to answer as you uh, may, but it's just for us to kick things off uh, and to start a conversation. So plants in your books are of course plants, but they're also uh, images and metaphors to uh, get there, I believe that you have, each one of you in their own way, have developed a relationship to them that will justify this constant presence in your writing. So I would like to ask you to, uh, maybe Anna, I guess, wants to start, but we'll see who'll start. If you could talk about your relationship to plants and how uh, the plants uh, come in your writing. And I would especially ask Anna to talk about uh, the Book of Gardens, Olive Livro dos Jardins, even though she can talk to other uh, about other books, and Zambra to talk about bonsai 
and also the private lives of the trees. And uh, please talk about these books. Uh, why uh, I ask you to talk about these books? Because in a certain way, plants are referred to as a part of a planting, growing, but also something that is the object of great attention. Gardens are the arranged plants as we wish to have, and bonsai is just a technique for gardening. And this already says a lot uh, about, you uh, know, on the second uh, part of the question, which is uh, the plants that in your book are plants that need care. So good evening, thank you for being here. And Anna, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, good evening. It is a pleasure to be here with you, even though I'm a bit nervous. And it's such a pleasure to share this uh, table with Alejandro. I'm not only a reader, but I'm also a great admirer. I would, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. <laughs> I, uh, I learned about his book, A Vida Privada das Árvores, The Private Lives of Trees. And the only trip I did to Chile in 2007 or eight, and I bought his book in, a, in a, a bookshop just by the title of the book. I didn't know anything about him at the time. And I read it at that same afternoon. And the next day I went back to that same bookstore, <laughs> bookstore and bought bonsai immediately afterwards. So it's because of that, the fact that I didn't even know Santiago. And then I, I spent most of the time of my trip reading his books. And, uh, and it was just by chance. And then uh, I have been following, of course, his, uh, his writings with great interest and enthusiasm. So um, when I was invited by Flip, knowing that the topic of this edition would have to do with plants, I confess that my first reaction was a bit that's saying, well, well, that's a mistake because my relation, I don't, I don't have any kind of deep knowledge of plants. I don't even know how to make, I know one, I don't know one tree from the next. My mother is a graduate in biology and she's a science professor. She knows science, but it's definitely not my case. I was reminded of a book by Clarice Lispector, The Woman Who Killed the Fish. And I thought that I would have to uh, do, start by doing a mea culpa for all the plants that I already let die, even for, because of excess care or too much water, I don't know. But anyway, so I thought about my book, uh, the Book of Gardens, uh, Livro de Jardins in Portuguese. And this is something that happens very frequently for those who write fiction and poetry and uh, uh, when you write uh, something that you don't even know very well what you're doing or what you're writing about and uh, you are taken to certain paths and ways and then after having written you are then uh, called back to be held accountable for what you wrote and you have to give meaning to that so this book is a book from 2019, as you said. It was published by Keldonio Publishing House. It's a very special edition, very artisanal, done in typography and uh, special paper. And it brings together these poems I wrote in, in a long, long time. So there's um, a type of uh, cultivating time. It was a book that was written very slowly throughout many years. And uh, it practically starts, it, the second poem starts with a sort of a confession, like the one I'm just doing here, that actually I don't have exactly an intimate relation with plants. I have a relation of maybe fascination or interest, but uh, at the same time, uh, a certain awareness of this interval, of this distance, and the silence of the plants. I have a poem that I really enjoy from Szymborsk. It's called The Silence of the Plants. And, and she starts by saying uh, something like, a, a conversation between us is necessary and impossible. And I guess uh, the Book of Gardens is a little bit that. It's an attempt of bringing together plants, but at the same time, a certain awareness so that there is a distance, a fracture. 
I thought maybe uh, to start, I would read this poem that we had separated or mentioned. It's, uh, it doesn't have a title, uh, the poem. So I don't know the name of the plants, but I don't know the name of a good part of my neighbors. And differently from people, plants don't care. I don't call them by name, but actually I don't call them at all. They don't ask for anything and they never complain. Sometimes they lose their leaves or just in silence, they die. They're always moving, but they never move. But we are for now standing. Thank you, Anna. Alejandro, welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation, Rita, and for your introduction. So kind. And Anna, concerning this encounter, I had the opportunity to read your poetry, and I learned much from your poetry. Although I don't know the names of the plants either, they've taught me a lot as well. I don't know exactly where to begin, but probably the first idea of this book, Bonsai, had to do with some images that came in the newspaper, pictures from this project for the Christ and Jean-Claude, the Cristo, the Cristo, the artist, not Jesus Christ. It belonged to wrapped twists, wrapped trees. These artists who they wrapped monuments, so it's Cristo, and there were interventions that had wrapped trees, not just statues, but trees. My first reaction was not positive, it was rather negative. It was more like, what are they? This is the last thing they should be making up, but the image stuck in my head. And it sounded, looked beautiful and disturbing. And it's actually beautiful. In other words, more than beautiful, rather problematic and seductive, something that sticks, moves you, and provokes re, uh, disgust as well. Perhaps at the same time to begin to notice the popularity of bonsai plants in Chile and Santiago. Bonsais got so popular and people were, it was like a fad and they kept bonsai plants at home. And a lot of them died because bonsai are not uh, plants to keep indoors and they were perceived just like uh, surroundings. They got cute, like, and I began to take interest in bonsai plants and research. I think Alejandro's oh, I guess he had a problem connection with froze connection. for a second. It seems so. I wasn't sure if it was a connection, my connection, but I saw that Anna was moving. So um, let, let us see if he comes back. But uh, Anna, well, yeah, maybe I'll, re I'll read. I'd just like to just comment on one thing. Uh, but uh, I, di I didn't reach that that issue. This whole idea of a garden, like you mentioned, is uh, is a relation with nature, but a nature like a miniature nature, uh, nature that is not in human scale, a bit uh, uh, formatted into the domestic space. And this has a relation with uh, bonsai, with this um, nature uh, in miniature. And as in Alejandro's book, this relationship between bonsai and writing is explicitly uh, shown. 
And I was thinking about this, about this uh, relation. And uh, I guess in his book, I, I, I wasn't made aware of this, but after uh, reading Alejandro's book, this relation between uh, writing and planting, there's something about cultivation, about caring for some things, but also the type of attempt of controlling things that you actually can't uh, control. And I guess this is what happens in this writing very frequently. At the same time, uh, the poem is a bit a device to help us investigate things, plants themselves. It's always a, a type of a species, um, a type of a creature that will end up having, it's a new being, let's say, uh, it has uh, its own life, so to speak. Yeah, this is what I was thinking, it has its own life, yes. It's not exactly the nature, the attained nature, but you don't know what, what's going to become of it. Anna, wouldn't you like to read another uh, poem from the Book of the Gardens while we wait for Alejandro to come back? I'm going to read one that um, uh, talks directly to this issue of control, of uh, this attempt of uh, controlling things. Uh, it's, it has no title. So you apply yourself to cultivation, but no matter how much you plan, every garden is unpredict unpredictable. Some plants will grow, others won't. The ones that we thought would never grow became exuberant. Others we had to cut down because uh, we couldn't, it couldn't reach the light. Little by little, we adjusted the garden and the garden adjusted itself. It adjusted its size, its availability of uh, water and sun. One day abandoned, this garden will invade the house as a memory that was invaded by the forgetfulness and the things of the past. I guess Alejandro is back. Alejandro, can you hear us? Yes, I yes, can hear I can quite hear, well. But I don't, I don't know, know what happened. happened. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. My internet. No problem. You can hear me? I changed rooms. Let's see. I'm in my bedroom now. So just to let you know what happened <laughs> during your absence, Anna talked a little bit more. She uh, started talking again about this whole idea of the garden and how um, your poetry or her poetry is also something that um, uh, will become something else, something different. So. Of course, she can say this. And so she read another poem. So everything while we were waiting for you to come back. But we come back to you now. Uh, you were talking about uh, the fact that you started to be interested on a bonsai. It was not, uh, I wasn't able to hear the translation. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Everything crashed suddenly. But anyway, I was saying in my personal case, bonsai called my attention, I began to study them. And I realized, for example, and the violence in, it was very obvious in the sense, in the disguised way, okay, aestheticism, because they're, they're very carefully kept and very intentional bodies that twist the development of nature, their growth, the growth of life. So especially I thought in like in behind wiring and barbed wire fences, they're submitted to a plan and manipulated for them to grow in a certain direction. And this process of wound, if you take the wires away, you can see the 
wounds on the bonsai trees. This seemed to me something like like an atmosphere. It was like a vague similitude, but the atmosphere that I was feeling, it, sounded, it was very familiar to me somehow. Perhaps these trees that grow like a stick to keep them growing straight or a stake. So I thought that this had to do with the repression, repression. And the, it was also significant to conceive our own generation that had grown up under repression. So what interested me had to do with this ambiguity, an ambiguity, which on the one hand was received automatically as beauty. Nevertheless, it was founded on horror and violence as this cohabiting inside an organism uh, basically in the, that and i took interest and it's interesting to distinguish between the bonsai the plant in other words they say okay bonsais are not exactly plants actually they are they are repressed trees to function as plants something like that repressed trees this appeared to me to be very moving and significant Thank you, Alejandro. So uh, the production is asking if you uh, joined uh, the Spanish interpretation so that you can have access to. If it entered, if I entered in Spanish, I can hear. Can I hear the other audio? Yes. I don't know. You can hear the translation. It worked. Great, great, great. So, so great. Now we're, we're all set. So thank you. The uh, image you shared with us of this uh, uh, repressed tree is, um, it's a showcase. It's um, illustrative of your book. It's curious to understand, you know, how you also say this, you know, we, we sometimes we write one single long book, and especially uh, in these two initial books, these first books, uh, Bonsai and The Private Life, and uh, Chilean Poet, uh, these books are deeply interconnected, even through plants, but not only plants. So, Zambra, I would like to talk about two other aspects of your books which I believe are intertwined with uh, this topic. One is this uh, relation between a stepfather and a stepchild. It's one of the topics of uh, the uh, Chilean poet, the Poeta Chileno. For those who haven't yet read it, uh, it's, not, it's not a spoiler because it's right in the beginning. I guess it's around page 50, this information. This child starts to show up. But it's a 400 page book, more than 400 pages. So it's not really a spoiler. Everything that I tell here that will go up to page 50, 60 is and can be considered a spoiler. But still, there's one thing that we see uh, also in the private life, which is this paternity or this uh, role of a, of a father paternal to care for a child that is not yours, so to speak or maybe in another situation, to be that uh, terrified child. And not only that, also in your book, there is one aspect, uh, which is this, the imminence of disappearance, this idea that you will care for a child is a, a little bit that, you know, it's also always that question brought forward by the adult or, or in forma de voltar para casa is for children. So, uh, what if they don't come back? Ways of, of going home, sorry. And uh, 
this is something that has to do with the recent history of uh, Chile, the story of our generation. And at the same time, and uh, bringing this uh, to the topic of this uh, flip, there's this thing that is uh, beautiful, the way you narrate this in uh, the private life of trees is to invent to the stepdaughter. He invents the story, stories that have trees as as uh, main characters in the beginning she talks about an alamo and a baoba and here i refer to that we'll talk about photosynthesis uh, squirrels or the advantages of being trees and not to people or animals and as i say to be these stupid uh, blocks of cement so if you could talk a little bit about these uh, two aspects of this literary dimension but also political aspect of the fear of disappearing and uh, given the disappearance, who will take over the space of caring? Who cares? Who cares for that child, for that, uh, this uh, fear that will uh, be shown in different ways in your books? Of course, everything you've mentioned are topics that interest me and have for years to continue with the line of what we were talking about before. The private lives of trees started with bonsai. If it's so connected literally to a tie, the lead character as a stepfather who is caring for the stepson, well, the, uh, with the stepdaughter, rather, while waiting for the mother to return. And he's happy because he's just written a book. He just finished uh, writing a book, which, which he'd been working on for a long time. But Veronica tells, look, I finally finished my book. But fine, she takes a long time to come home. And meanwhile, if you and now having finished writing a book becomes less important, the fact that he finished writing the book, because of course, life is much more important than literature, of course. And so I believe that in some sense, the legitimacy of this exercise, for example, writing a book is placed in doubt and placed in doubt the legitimacy of the bonsai as a tree as well as a tree a manipulated tree a mutant tree or rather a failed tree and i think that all of our discussions currently uh, discussions about legitimacy, right? In principle, I saw this theme from my own generation when we said when they said we didn't have the right to talk about the history of our country because we hadn't lived in the Allende government. We had grown up under a dictatorship. But and it was like it, we had been protected in a sense. So in some sense, I was asking about the nature of this kind of protection. What does it mean to have been, been protected? And meanwhile, I, when we study literature for everyone, it was like a very uh, stubborn step because obviously this literature, studying literature was not uh connected to job security or the kind of career that our parents wanted for us nevertheless also a lot of teachers said okay you don't ha have the right to talk about the dictatorship because you haven't read anything of course at 18 years of age you hadn't read anything anyway you think that your teachers have read everything of course there was a kind of a double denial because your parents said that we hadn't lived 
we hadn't lived and our teachers said that we hadn't read so it was difficult i believe to escape from this kind of paralysis induced paralysis induced by the generation the older generation but i believe that naturally the question now that i need to answer from the perspective of parents a parent and the stepfather how we reformulate authority legitimacy and how we take charge of a crisis and deal with a huge crisis and that appears irreversible almost and how we realize and take awareness of the past without defending ourselves from immediately from the accusations that the following generations are going to make against us. I think we're interested in this. What we do with authority, for example, who we are as parents, I was thinking how we reformulate authority and how I believe we grew up with the idea of authority, which is like an aggressive authority because of the dictatorship, the parents, it's as if the parents were always dictators. Of course, in addition, we grew up in a dictatorship. This idea was reinforced by the issues that interest me. I don't know if I could provide an answer for myself. I believe I write my books to seek to find ways of entering into these issues and subjects, but I'm very interested in the, this, uh, the uh, Chilean poet, this novella, the same thing of uh, teaching. I'm also interested in a different way in teaching because we could explain parenting, biological parenthood in the explanation of the existence in life. Who knows? You, I'm not explaining it too well. It's if we, I'm trying to explain in the point of an extraterrestrial biology differs in getting involved in the adoptive parenting, which is the most beautiful parenting. This is easy to explain, of course. There are boys and girls who don't have biological parents because they've been abandoned. Other people uh, play the role of parents and they adopt them. They become the parents, adoptive parents. But what is in the middle is very difficult to explain. And stepfatherhood as a specific story, a specific wrote associated with step parenting. In other words, it's just not, it's not a result of a plan. It's simply you fall in love with somebody who already has children and you begin to play a role of step parenting, which is not necessary. You didn't necessarily want to play. There's something right there that's very interesting, I believe, in step parenting, because of course, every human beings we've reflected on the possibility of being parents or fathers or mothers, but in this case, it occurs as a kind of improvisation, so to speak, which is not associated with risk. And you receive in Spanish or in Portuguese, a pejorative, a heavy pejorative load, the ugly words, stepfathers, stepmothers. And we can understand it in this angle, these words, they, be, they become pejorative in Spanish and Portuguese because we've created uh, uh, kids' stories where stepfathers and stepmothers are evil and cruel and the, the talking about the stepfather is uh, like a terrible figure. So a stepfather, nevertheless, to be a good stepfather and concerned about the stepchild and wanting to understand step parenting as parenting, 
Nevertheless, everything that I said previously, you can understand the harm and the, the, the being being capable of understanding the prejudice with uh, which is an object of this prejudice. You can understand the prejudice concerning these are very heavy issues and very impactful and uh, meriting re our reflection, I believe. Yes, yes. I was going to comment something about the uh, poeta chileno, the Chilean poet, in this uh, link between stepfather and stepchild, but then that would be a spoiler. So it's a, I would just leave it as a suggestion for those who wish to read this. Um, there is a... Um, you move forward in this book, or you go further down that road in this book, and to talk about paternity and... Uh, since we're talking about paternity here, of course, uh, uh, playfully, a question we always ask with Chilean authors, and of course, this also has to do with Anna, who's also a reader of this author, and it also has to do with the fact that as a Chilean poet, this author is uh, referred to many times, and you both do this, Anna, in poetry and you in your novel with uh, lyrism and uh, Omo is uh, Roberto Bolaño, Bolaño, the poet and the prose writer, the way that you say, well, uh, in different moments in the poem and in the romance and the novel, we'll say, I know the poems, but oh, they say I have to read uh, the uh, novels. So this is a point of contact between these two books, these two books, the last books you wrote. Uh, Anna in Prosa Deutsch, Prose 2, she talks about that. And in uh, also in the Chilean poet, this uh, shows up in certain moments. So if you could talk a little bit um, about this and this relation with writers, with other writers the, that will, uh, that you visit immensely in your work, this dialogue, this reference. And so I wanted to bring together with another question that I would ask, if you could talk a little bit about them based on Bolaño, this Bolaño, who is also, he's a prose writer and a poet. Anna, let's start with you. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but also I would like to make a comment here about what um, Alejandro was saying uh, about this relationship. It, it's it's a topic, it's a strong topic of, of in his novels. It's a, um, the whole idea of a sort of um, a legacy between generations and also uh, this relationship between um, father and son. But I was thinking that maybe uh, the Chilean poet not only has this, but it has also not only the uh, relation of uh, 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 paternity, but also the uh, creation of the other communities, a type of uh, the creation of other alliances, which go through this uh, relationship of friendship and also the relationship between the stepfather and the stepchild, and also through poetry. Uh, there's a community, even though it's uh, a bit ironic, the way they refer to to, it, to this uh, type of community. It's also a warm way. It's an indicator of other possibilities of uh, communities and alliances beyond this more authoritarian relation of the paternity and the, so this is just something that came to mind. With regards to Bologna, this uh, very explicit uh, reference and the uh, poem uh, Prosa, uh, prose to in my last book, uh, Bologna is an author I admire immensely and, uh, and I, I reached uh, Bolaño because of his fiction. And then I went into his uh, his poetry. But his um, fiction will mobilize a number of different characters, poets, and also uh, surrounding this whole myth of poetry and the figure of a poet, not only a poetry as a, a practice, a literary practice, but also as a way of life, a way of also 
uh, developing communities. And this relation between prose and poetry in uh, Bolanya's work, there are different ways of reading and understanding. I'm not a specialist and not a very systematic reader, but what I was interested in this poem was this mixture between prose and poem, a bit of a tension that you have in Bolanya's work and how prose can use poetry as a topic, but poems can be a bit of uh, miniature narratives. And this is, a, he's just an author I very enjoy. I do not wrote prose, I do not, do not write prose, but I have an interest as a reader in prose, and that's it. And I wrote this uh, poem that is a bit of a uh, homage, a tribute to Bolaño. Thank you, Ana. Alejandro? Yes, I love Bolaño, especially I feel that the savage detectives I love when it was published in 1998, 1998 or 1999, when I wasn't a good reader of narrative, current narrative. In other words, and it wasn't one to go to a bookstore and buy a novel, a recent novel, a current prose. But the Savage Detectives, I loved, and it helped me to create a feeling of community between several different readers who we wrote poetry and we felt very marginalized, left out of the world, not included in this country, which declared its splendor, economic miracle, and proclaimed that the age of the dictatorship, the wound of the dictatorship had healed. That was the discourse we ran up against when we were 24 years of age, 23, 24 years of age. Okay, they said that Chile was a country, prosperous country and joyous country. And we didn't feel included in this discourse. I say this somewhat joking that the 1990s, somewhat joking, somewhat seriously, the 1990s for us, Chile was a horrible country with marvelous poetry because many of those who met uh, uh, through poetry, loved Chilean poetry, and we felt outside, we were out of tune with Chile, right? Of course, it was, a, it was an unfair feeling, but books like Bolaños and other authors also generated the feeling that it made sense. This margin, the bank that you inhabited, like a community, you're inhabiting a bank. And history showed that, of course, this Chile the, was a fiction, the successful uh, story induced by the mass communication media in Pinochet was still heading the armed forces and he had a, a lifelong position. And the history finally proved that Chilean society was still in an intense discussion and a discussion that continues to this day. And so I believe that that's, I feel attuned with this question and tune into it. I believe that I could say it in this way, in the broadest sense, we feel very identified with this way of living and confronting, confronting fate. And that gave us joy. I know that to put it like this might sound oversimplistic, but I remember indeed 
this laughter, a different kind of laughter, which came from a kind of prose and deep prose and full of details. Many people, I believe, based on this, also we began to take prose seriously and try to write or show what we were, had already written. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, you went above and beyond, which was great. Thank you so much for your answer. Well, we could continue, but uh, I'm going to try to move forward. We are now, so we don't have that much time left. So, but I have a lot more questions to ask. So, so let's try to move forward. Anna, there is a dimension in the uh, Book of Gardens, the Livro dos Jardins, that I would like you to comment, please. Uh, the book, for those who haven't read it, it's divided in two parts, two sections. One is uh, in the gardens offered to uh, writers or uh, in tribute of our uh, writers. And they are, uh, it says, uh, so this uh, person is uh, this and that person. So there's this connection of a um, an intimacy when you build these gardens, these gardens that are offered to these writers and poets. So this is uh, for these gardens, for this uh, cultivating a place that you've established as dialogue. We're talking about literary uh, paternity or maternity. And these gardens that are offered are very different. It's as if you were referring to what is your relation to the work of each one of them? And these are all women. What is the idea here? What could you talk about that? What could you say about this dedicated garden? Yes, uh, I want to talk a bit more with Alejandro instead of answering. I said since the beginning, this was, <laughs> you didn't need mediation because Anna has two books done in partnerships. Everything she knows is to uh, have this dialogue. My presence is uh, just to remind you that we have time. Please go ahead You can talk directly to Alejandro if you wish. There's this, this dialogue in uh, Zambra's book where uh, this character says, they don't know how to speak. They're poets, but they don't know how to speak. They write poems because they don't know how to speak. And this is my favorite part of his book because I identified so much of that. This, uh, when you, you stutter, uh, you know, of, of these poets uh, that can't speak. But I'd just like to make a brief comment, very superficial comment, to say that one of the um, things that impacted me in reading Zambra, and this has to do with uh, how he was uh, welcomed in Brazil, his reading, his writing, not only uh, he has amazing books, but the way that he deals with memory heritage, the military dictatorship, it's not very well processed, so to speak, in Brazil, uh, much less than in Chile or even in Argentina. And this is something that we see the consequences, not only the literary consequence, but we have a president of the Republic that is able to uh, complement the dictatorship still today, uh, unable to, uh, he was able to uh, pay tribute to uh, torture in uh, our in Congress. So these issues that are present in uh, Sambra's work have a great impact and a great interest for all of us here, uh, Brazilian readers and writers. But it's on the second part of my book, of the garden. As you said, these are tributes. These are poems that are tributes. And they are all dedicated to uh, women, poets, who had some kind of importance to me, uh, that were important to me. At, and so there was Elise Contela, Sylvia Plath, a poem for Vislav Shimborska. So six or seven, and Pizarniki also. So these poems, well, in a certain way, a dialogue with the work of these authors. 
sometimes through an image, sometimes with one single poem, sometimes more as an atmosphere. This relation is not always straightforward. And this is why they're not exactly uh, poets based on these workers, but it's for them. It's uh, a gift, it's a dedication, it's a poets that gave me so much and I wanted to give something back to them in a certain way, uh, like someone who offers uh, flowers, even though uh, is a Sylvia Plath's poem. Uh, flower, flowers can also be very bad, terrifying things. She has a poem, she says that tulips should be behind bars like a beast. So these are tributes for uh, authors I admire and love, and they also have to do uh, with gardens too. Yes, I was reminded of a poem, which is in a crosses word, Hiska essa palavra. It's uh, one of the uh, excerpt that you talk about um, stopping, uh, to stop smoking, and you create this uh, bouquet of cigarette packs. Uh, and it, there is this, uh, something that is a bit scary. So um, there's a question for both of you, but I, I will uh, start by Anna because it has this, uh, then this thread that will take us to Alejandro Sana. If you could maybe briefly, um, of course, it's a natural world in a certain way. I want to talk about water and uh, sea, but also talking about homes, the home. Anna is from the uh, state of Minas Gerais. It's a landlocked uh, state. But uh, there's this book uh, she wrote with uh, Eduardo Jorge, and uh, and she writes a lot about the sea. And among the different images, she writes about uh, uh, home. And there are two things she writes about home. And I will uh, ask her to talk about this. She says, my house is the open sea, open water. And then my house is a tree in front of the house. And there are many, many poems in all her books about the sea. What is this relationship between uh, the uh, landlocked, landlocked writer and uh, the sea? And the, the underwater life of Vida Submarina, there's this absolutely fabulous poem and, uh, and that also is seen there. So I ask you before I pass the floor to Zambra with uh, another detail of um, this uh, aspect. It is a, a recurring question, I guess, because, yes, because I am from the state of Minas Gerais. Uh, it's a state that, as I said, is a landlocked, landlocked it doesn't have sea. But at the same time, we always, my poems have much to do with uh, uh, sea images. I'm not sure because it's not, actually, it's not so surprising actually to me at least for someone who has seen, you know, someone from the state of Minas going to the beach, the relationship between um, uh, people from Minas with the sea is very strong. They love it. In my case, it's exactly because I've always lived away from the sea. Um, the sea is something very enigmatic and uh, attractive. It's, um, there is this dimension also of the risk. I was able, never able to, to be very, familiarized with the sea. So, so also uh, we have the sea images or imageries that have a relationship, for, for instance, with the um, images of, of desire, something that you are not fully uh, knowledgeable about, but it's an, a space of immersion that absorbs you completely, that takes over you. But it's also very primordial uh, space because you have maybe contact with something that is existed even before a human existence. So I am, yes, fascinated by the sea. And it's interesting to uh, see these excerpts you uh, decided to refer to because the images of the sea are maybe in opposition and in a dialogue with the images of the home as if they were two um, strengths uh, working in my poetry. On one hand, you have the desire of uh, the wish of being protected in a home and a tree. And at the same time, it is permeable. It is open to the outside, so to speak. So I guess it's really a recurring topic, both home and sea. So maybe that's a bit of an opposition. So yes, you were right. And um, 
And in the uh, Poeta Chileno, Alejandro, there is this excerpt in, uh, w in which Prue, uh, the American, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give up. So, so this is character. She's a foreigner uh, and she goes to Valparaíso. She's coming from the city of Santiago and she's going to Valparaíso, another city in Chile. And the narrator says that she, she thinks that doesn't make sense for so many people to live in Santiago. It's as if they wanted to hide uh, from the sea. And there's this image that is a very beautiful image also involving this character uh, and it's narrated to her about the house, the home. I'm not, it's not, not exactly a house on stilts, but it would be equivalent, equivalent of a house on stilts. But these are homes that are uh, put on stilts and uh, over the water. And that they could be mobile. They could uh, go, leave, and then the stilts would stay. So the land will stay and the house would leave. And they'd be taken away by, by water itself. There's a, there's a scene in which this is uh, told. And so Alejandro lives in Mexico. He writes about Chile, about this uh, republic of uh, poets. Could you say that your home and the land stayed back? Did your house leave and your land stayed back? Maybe. I've been living here for five years now. I believe that this reflection we think about that a lot but also my house is where my son is it's he's very mexican he speaks mexican more than anybody i've ever heard so mexican spanish so the exercise is rather to imagine what he would think of Chile. I'm very interested in the pandemic has been very cruel for everyone. And we've lived far from our fatherland. We have the feeling like a turbulent and difficult to define. We've comparing the pandemics it's also been very important in Chile, in many senses, very impactful. The uh, causes uh, for decades that are important that could generate a new order of things. On the one hand, we're writing in this house, Chile, a new constitution, right? Meanwhile, we're on the verge of confrontation between two different antagonistic visions of our country, our society. And we're all very worried about the possibility that we, a fascist, come to power and have a Pinochet type president with a kind of a Bolsonaro or Trump, a Chilean Trump or Chilean Bolsonaro. So we're kind of hopeful and scared at the same time. The possibility of real generational changes and attention to the emphasis on the people. But this in a scary possibility of losing the rights that we've won and that it would seem that we'd build, it would be like backstepping paradoxically. It might sound paradoxical, but the last time I was in Brazil was a few days before Bolsonaro was elected. So I do identify with this kind of time, the age. I remember this time with these dialogues that I had with desperate people. The, with my friends in Brazil, of course, people were, I don't remember what you were asking me now, but now I've forgotten the question. 
and I think of Chile, I think of all of this, I think of the differences between between the way the, the pandemic was uh, managed in Chile and Mexico. I think of everybody has been thinking this difference between I and we and how we've concentrated at our own private space and this makes us more selfish or more displaying more solidarity. It's a time, it's a long time in which the word time almost is, scares us immediately. But of course we have this discussion of space in our heads and language in our heads too. This dialogue finally awakens you more, I think. In other words, fine. To explain, I write in Chilean Spanish, but I live in Mexican Spanish. And far from understanding this as a problem, I understand it and I see it as an opportunity because every day more living words from Chile Chilean Spanish, the language, I recover the Chilean Spanish because it comes back and becomes present, especially when there are two ways of saying the same language. They're speaking it, I think they have a, a polyphonous sound in my head, which I love. And this happens with spaces as well. Everything that I see here in Mexico awakens memories in me. It doesn't make me insensitive. I'd like to walk with my son in Chile in the landscapes, but I also like this reality of being guided by my son. He knows, thanks to his grandmother and all the names of the plants, He's, he's only four, but he can name all the plants. And he explains things to me, thinking to me about the plants because of course, partly there are plants that I don't know and there are others whose name is different here in Mexico as compared to Chile. So I believe that getting back to the original theme of the round table, okay, yes, I like movement, the feeling of movement. I'm not, I'm not, I'm intrigued, not overwhelmed by movement. I'm interested in this feeling of movement. When I think of Chile, of course, today, I'm concerned about what's happening and worried about what's happening in my country, precisely because towards the way things are moving, it's very decisive. Yes, it's possible that the presidency will be won by my candidate and many Chileans want. And apparently a government like the one that he has proposed will as much close to the problems, the contemporary problems, including climate change, of course, and the redefinition of the roles and all different orders of things. But the other path is like going back to the dictatorship, the other candidate. So ideologically, and this really concerns me. I know you didn't ask me that, but I had to say that anyway. But I've been thinking about that every day, so it's difficult not to say it, not to address this and approach it. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have run out of time. The uh, producers, if it were in Parachi, I would certainly uh, uh, stay longer, but we have a transmission, a broadcast on TV, so we can't continue. We have two minutes, according to Andrea, to close. So I will ask you to say your farewells and um, very Briefly, I would suggest uh, 
that you would. I'm, 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 now I have one minute, two minutes. So, so this is it. I'm going to ask you. Uh, so in Parachi, and the uh, Parasa de Matriz, there's normally uh, an art installation uh, because of flipping of books that are hanging. It's a big tree and books hanging from the tree. So considering as if we were in Parachi, tell me one book we should hang on this uh, tree and a plant to plant there. And this is where we will close. Please flip, don't cut them off. Oh no. So before I'm going to say very briefly also uh, with respect to what Zambra was saying, I guess uh, we are in Brazil also with, uh, the thought we're thinking about uh, Chile, and it's something that is is within the topic of flip. And because if we see how the Brazilian government has uh, taken a project of destruction, environmental destruction, a, a programmed environmental destruction, and these issues are all interconnected, and they're they're a reason of great concern. So. Uh, this question, the book, it's always very difficult. Um, you talked about this tree, I didn't know. I remind, I was reminded of a character of Bolaño. She hangs the books on uh, the, the dryer, you know, so that they could learn with the world on the clothesline. So she hangs the, the, the books on the clothesline. So I don't know, I thought very, I thought maybe, uh, so based on Poeta Chileno, I would put uh, Emily Dickinson, maybe. Uh, maybe a future poet will be able to see these words. So um, something we learned with, not only about poetry. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Flip. It was a pleasure. Yes, I agree with Anna, and I always remember this poem in Spanish is, I haven't told my garden yet, this poem, which always gave me kind of, it overwhelmed me and this intimacy, intimacy, this they still haven't told my garden. I thought of a song by Violeta Parra, very well known, which I loved when I was son, called The Gardener. There's a time when she says, Violeta Parra said, the flowers in my garden will be my nurses. In other words, the flowers as nurses of uh, the as caregivers, this is a very beautiful image, I think, and I remember. But perhaps this garden uh, by Violeta Parra should be replicated in Parachi. Thank you so much, both of you and all those who were with us until now. It was a pleasure. Uh, unfortunately, we have to close now. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Thank you so much, Ana. And I hope to see you soon in Paraty.